Many people think that life is sort of coming to an end at the age of 70, and it might have been the case years ago, but certainly not today. Being a blind acupuncturist, I'm used to changing perceptions, but also being blind has taught me you can accept it as a challenge, providing one has a good mental outlook, willing to give something a go, then the whole world opens up completely. Hey, life's just great. My name is Ivan, Ivan Pavak. I'm 72 years old and people say that I don't look my age, but I don't know because I'm blind. So what I have here is a handheld transceiver. ZR1IA, ZR1IA, listening on one Charlie, ZR1IA by. Aging is a process that affects everyone differently. And the important factor is not to think of um, aging as something that is going to make life worse. Hobbies are really, really important. Have a look at this radio tower that I have in the garden. It's sort of telescopic tilt over tower. And if I wanted to go higher, I've got a winch there, it tilts up higher and higher and higher until about 60 feet. And there's also a rotator that allows me to turn this antenna into any part of the world that I want to talk to. When you reach the age that I'm at and take a very keen interest in what goes on in the world, and you realise that we are all dependent on each other, that, as the saying goes, you know, man is not an island. Okay, this oh. is N5VCM. A oh, very good evening to you there. The name is Ivan, Italy, Victor, Abel, Nancy. And the QDH here is Auckland in North Island of New Zealand. My name is Mark and I'm located in Houston, Texas. Amateur radio is really enriching because fundamentally you're communicating with people. So, you know, I've got to know a little bit more about the world. And, you know, if they're interested, they'll ask about me. People ask me, you know, what, you know, what do you see? How much sight do you have, you know? I really don't have any sight at all. No workable vision. And so there is a, just a sort of a pale, a ghostly gleam, particularly with the sun's out, but, you know, that's really all. You've got touch and you've got smell and you, you've got perceptions about you which uh, compensates uh, for that lack of sight. Now, get this stick out. Yeah, OK. I was born in a small town of Matamata in the heart of the Waikato, and it was a great childhood. As children, you could wander all over the town. The town was small enough that on your push bike, you could be anywhere in 15 minutes. And in three or four minutes, you can be out in the countryside looking in bushes for birds or in streams looking for eels and so on. I lost my sight in two different occasions. One, when I was about six or seven, I was jumping off a banister on the back veranda and hit my head. And as a result of that, over a matter of maybe two years, it was noticeable that the site was um, becoming worse. The second accident, I was about 12. I just got hit in the eye with a tennis ball. Just one of these freak accidents that happened. And in both cases, the loss of vision was really due to um, detached retina, and that's how I became blind. The way I processed losing sight as a child was very simple. So when I was in the hospital, the doctors and the nurses would always say, don't remove the bandages. And so one night, I decided to lift the bandage up from the eyes, and then I turned the overhead light on and looked up in it. And the overhead light was really a yellowy, reddy colour. It was a glow as if it was underwater. And I looked at that for most probably 30 seconds, and I thought, well, if that's as good as it gets, then that's what it is. I went to the Foundation for the Blind School in Parnell. I was exposed to activities at the Foundation that I wouldn't have been exposed to in Matamata. The first thing I had to learn was Braille. 
I remember the headmaster on the first morning, he put this braille book down on my lap and he, and he rubbed my hand across it and he said, boy, that's what you got to learn. <laughs> and it was just a blur of dots. But it stimulated a learning interest. Bit by bit, the world that I was looking out on began to change. With all these changes that were occurring, there was just this attitude that there's so much out there, let's go and explore it. This is my PC here where I do most of my research. I operate the computer via speech. Okay, you are Gun. Gun, um, R -O -R -R -O -R -O -R. Whatever comes up on the screen, the software reads it out aloud to me. At the moment, my interest is in the history of the Kauri gum industry of Northland. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very um, boring, but in fact, um, it's a fascinating history, economic history of Northland. The end goal of the research is to write a concise history of those times. Also, the research helps with another hobby of Toastmasters. I read somewhere that it's all about public speaking. And I thought, yeah, I, I could do that OK. Um, because it's only talking and I'm interested in communication. And so I joined the local club. And uh, as time went by, you know, you gain your first um, award, then the next award and next award. I ended up being an advanced gold Toastmaster. And that's how I met Karen, present partner. OK, Karen, now what have we, um, what have we got out for preparation? Um, now let's see, um, got the tagine. Oh, we've been together for 14 years and it's been an amazing sort of a journey. The day that I first met Ivan, Ivan was giving a speech and yeah, it was a very, very interesting speech, quite long. He sort of didn't exactly answer the question, but he, got, he sort of elaborated somehow, you know, rather mystically. That's how our friendship began. A lot of things we'll do together and yet separately. So you've got your cardamom and your uh, cumin powder out? Just the packets? Gardening, for example, and cooking. And so, you know, you do share experiences. He's got a delightful sense of humour. Quite, quite um, dry and sort of wicked. <laughs> This is an induction cooktop, and I, I really like it because um, you can put your hand on it and you don't get burnt. Right, right. We'll put in about um, a quarter of a cup of water, so you need to get that ready, OK? Do you want the tomato? Uh, uh, um, no, if you could just get some water ready now, please, that'll be great. He's pretty much the boss, but then again, you know, I have to step up. <laughs> now, Karen, I'm going to turn this down to three. Yeah. Uh, now, because it's bubbling nicely. I can tell when the meat's cooked uh, by the, the texture when I'm uh, tapping it with the wooden spoon. You can feel whether it's hard or soft. And also by uh, the smell of the meat when it's cooking. Um, sometimes it can be a bit deceptive, particularly if it's been marinated, because uh, that sometimes hide a bit of the, you know, the, the smell from the meat. But it's, uh, yeah, it works out OK. Alexa. Set curry timer for 40 minutes. Curry timer, 40 minutes, starting now. Alexa is another device which I use very, very often for communicating and particularly for finding out information. And so um, if I speak to somebody in another country on the ham radio, uh, I can always ask her uh, more information about that city or you know, surrounding geography or history. Um, and so it brings my experience with the ham that I've been talking to much more meaningful. Uh, Alexa, what is the distance from Houston, Texas to Auckland, New Zealand? Houston is 11,917 kilometres from Auckland City as the crow flies. Right, OK. <laughs> OK, that's great. OK, well, bon appetit. Yeah. Mm, we'll see how... Looks good. Yeah, oh, well, that's, that's good, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, tomorrow night, if you like, we can have uh, tea in town. 
um, and uh, in the city. So you go to music practice, and then um, and then uh, it'll save you uh, having to cook and do things. He's done the most astonishing things, and I mean, it's in the past 14 years since I met him, it's been um, an astonishing experience. You know, overall, we've done loads of travel. When you think about it, the big concerts will be coming up. Are people mm -hmm. at school at the moment? Or... Mm -hmm. Shall I get it? Yeah. Do you want to get it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hello, I've been speaking. After leaving school, I decided that I'd go on to university and undertake a BA degree in psychology. By the time the degree finished, I thought to myself, hmm, perhaps it would be far better actually looking at physical problems that people had, backaches and so on. So I went to London and studied anatomy and physiology. In those days, when you studied osteology, the bones were actually human skeletons. And very often, going back to the student accommodation, catch the underground train, there'd be bones sticking out of my duffel bag, because people in the carriage would see this, and you'd always have plenty of room around you. It was never, never a problem, no matter how well packed the train was. Following really four years in London, I ended up in Hong Kong, because acupuncture was just beginning to be noticed in the West. The attitudes of people there are different to New Zealand. So on the Monday morning, when I arrived at the college, they said, oh, yes, you know, can we help you? And I said, oh, yes, I'm uh, so-and-so from New Zealand and uh, ready to uh, start the acupuncture course. And there was dead silence. And I thought, well, hang on, uh, what's going on here? And, um, and I could see straight away that, uh, that they um, uh, didn't really take it in, that I was actually blind. I came back to New Zealand and opened my own clinic. Right, hello, Tony. Are you ready for me, eh? I am. Come along through. All right. Traditionally, in a country like Japan, acupuncture was a traditional occupation for blind people. So you can imagine then coming back to New Zealand, opening a clinic, and being one of four acupuncturists in New Zealand at that time. All right, well, let's have a look here. Uh, see if that's uh, causing you any trouble. Uh, most probably will be a bit tender. How is that there? Is that a bit tender there? Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah. 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 One of the perceived difficulties is that, you know, how can a blind person do acupuncture? I'll put some um, needles in. I'll use uh, four needles on you, OK? Not too many. Obviously, I have better touch than other acupuncturists who have sight. I'm going to do one now below the knee because this ligament uh, runs um, sort of from above the knee across the bone and uh, down here to, to give that knee some support for you. So uh, Through my operation and all these doctors at the end of my bed and they said, well, we've done what we can for you. Um, so uh, it's more or less uh, you're on the bike. And then I turned up at Ivan's place here and I never realised that he was blind. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? A blind man with a handful of needles. <laughs> and uh, he was quite presently surprised. He does a marvellous job. He's got eyes on the end of his fingers, I'm sure. And I think somehow we established almost like a psychic link between us without realising it. A little tingle on the inside of the knee. So just let me know when you feel. It should be nice and pleasant. Uh, no pain whatsoever, OK? So it'll be one just below the knee and it'll be the outside needle that's on the other outer side of the knee. Yeah, so you can feel that now. From all the people, 100,000 or so that have come to me for treatment, I've always learned some little point from them. I couldn't live without my music. It's, it's in my head every day. New tunes, new, um, new way of doing them, um, arranging the different sounds, and uh, no, it's marvellous. I remember listening to a retired professor of gerontology that the, the people who were doing well in later life were those that were mentally stimulated and physically active. The old professor says that, boy, if you ain't learning, you're dying. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, that's yeah. good. 
Right, Tony, I'm going to take the needles out and uh, once I've done that, we'll uh, go and spend a little bit of time uh, exploring some music. When I came back and set my clinic up, I decided to go back to university extramurally and I studied a degree in business. I did that over eight years and that really was tough going when you're also working 75 hours a week. But eventually completed it. And in fact, two years ago, I was awarded a Massey University Distinguished Alumni Award. Right, right, Tony. Here we are. Wow. Well, yeah. Great guitar. <laughs> okay. Great. Family-wise, that part of your life's also extremely important. The lady I married, Cheryl, actually already had two sons. Luckily, they weren't rugby or cricket fanatics because I would have found it a bit difficult standing on the sideline. But everything else was absolutely fine. For them too, I think having a blind father wasn't anything out of the normal because I did everything else around the house. Cheryl, she was a beauty therapist and she had lots of clients. It was really a very, very hectic household. You're working long hours and in a week you could have 200 people coming through. I, you know, I might go to bed half past 11, but then I'd be up half past 12 and then I'd come downstairs and I'd be doing my study till four o'clock in the morning and another day would start. It takes a lot of fortitude to look after house and family and everything else. So, yeah, after 20 years, working very long hours, you just burnt out. All right, Karen, um, what do you think we need to do around here? This is the right time to, um, Prune, prune a little bit, tidy up perhaps the camellias um, here or, or the, um, the limes and lemons. I've got one, one here because it's growing over the pathway. Any form of gardening is amazing because it takes you away from your everyday activities as you're concentrating on a plant. And I can be outside gardening six, eight hours on a lovely Saturday or in the summer I can still be outside gardening at two o'clock in the morning. I don't need the light, everything's all very, very quiet, and I don't disturb anybody. So, um, you can see it's, it's really, really dense. I know how to garden because everything's done by touch, and when it comes to pruning, well, that's very tactile. In the wind, though, those two branches would rub together. I have to imagine what the tree is, and then think in my mind, how would I prune it to, to shape it, shape it up nicely? Looking back on it, I think 12 was actually a good age to lose one sight. I have a lot of wonderful visual memories. I can still describe things exactly as if I had actually seen them yesterday. I remember very clearly looking at the colours of hollyhocks or carnations or pansies. So today, if I'm wanting to develop memory, it's through other senses. Smell or the pattern of leaves on a branch, or perhaps the flowers that are on that branch. So vision isn't important, not for me. So yes, I have, I have a razor sense, so sharp, sharpness about me. I was attracted to judo in my teenage years, really for self-protection, I suppose, because a blind person, you know, you can't run. The first strategy is to talk, you know, what's the problem, see if you can sort something out. If that can't happen, the next step is you might have to defend yourself physically. Judo's all about keeping people off balance, and it doesn't really matter how small you are, how light you are, it's that element of surprise. If somebody comes up behind you and grabs you by the shoulders, then the thing you would do is be like that, from like that, see? As a blind person, I really had the advantage that my sense of balance is excellent. And the second thing is, I knew exactly where people were uh, in, in relation to my body. 
but perhaps I should do that again. Okay. Yeah. Now, so I get my my iPhone out. I'll spend an hour and a half at breakfast and before starting work, listen to some podcasts, electric vehicles. Okay. That's very really good, but I'll just have a look what other podcasts have come through. One I'm going to have a look at uh, is a BBC science program called Discovery. This is a podcast on Jane Goodall, who was uh, an anthropologist studying uh, the apes in Africa. This is an iPhone, but equally you can do it with an Android phone. There's speech in it, and for a blind person, you just activate the voiceover, which is Apple's... Uh, a speech program, and whatever's on the screen uh, is spoken out aloud. Modern communication as it is today it makes life a lot easier. But back 35 years ago, there was basically very little. And so in 1987, I established my importing business to bring in microprocessor devices that could have speech output. The principal reason behind that was lots of conditions that really weren't fixable, like somebody just had a stroke or um, you know, somebody's cerebral palsy, and you lost the power to speech. There was a lot of independence that could be given to people just to communicate. Another product was a voice amplifier if you have Parkinson's disease, one of the symptoms is that the loudness of your voice decreases. So we came out with the first voice amplifier that had a throat microphone, and we began to export those too. It was a period of time when I didn't actually have a holiday for 17 years. Companionship right throughout life is really important. And one of the aspects which scientists have discovered is men who live alone actually don't live as long a life as men who are married or in a partnership with someone else. The guest speaker tomorrow is the chap who was telling you all about the capacitors. Oh, down at the radio yeah, club. Yeah, he's going to be talking tomorrow. Yeah. On, uh... I sort of work hard to try to support his interests because it's a bit like these mothers with gifted children, how they have to work a bit harder to try to keep them stimulated in that. You generally prefer pasta, don't you? Uh, pasta. Mm. Oh, well, he might have toned it down a little bit in the time I've known him, but he has got plenty of energy. Mainly mental energy, yeah. Just have to keep the body working well, you know. Oh, wow, well, thanks very much. That's a lot of these stimuli that I take out of the environment, like touch and smell and, and just the ambience of where I am, I, I suppose that also translates to people. A little bit of ambience here, but <laughs> what's the day for in here then? Um, well, like foliage. For me, obviously, those visual cues aren't there. So the first contact I would have with someone is when they approach me and say, oh, hello, my name is Mary, or my name is Jack. You've got a very nice shirt that you're wearing. Yes, yes, no, I'm going to be very aware of it. And so from that very first opening, I start developing an impression of this person. So I'm not confused whether they are attractive, whether they're beautifully dressed, my curiosity would be aroused through their personality. I need to get out at the end of the week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Culture is always important. There have been many peoples arriving in New Zealand from Dalmatia, and those people have brought with them their cultures, food and music. Six, five, six. One, seven. We're at the Dalmatian Club this afternoon, playing a bingo. I'm a descendant of Dalmatian parents born here in New Zealand, so 
I never grew up, um, you know, in the culture itself. And so um, by coming to the club, um, I've been, been able to pick up on some of the culture and that uh, gives me a, a sense of where my roots lie. And one of the uh, nice points about the Dalmatian Club, you know, it's cultural and you're meeting, meeting people and having a chat. 6969. Oh, I oh, think I might have sold the cat. Oh, wow. What am I? But I could be wrong. I could well. be wrong. <laughs> The Dalmatian Club have an orchestra called the Tumbritza. I enjoy attending practice sessions because we have a wide range of musicians there, some learning, some advanced, but we're all there to enjoy music. When I was at the foundation for the Blind and Parnell at the school, there was a brass band. And so in order to learn the tunes, you know, we did learn braille music. A little bit more difficult reading braille music and playing at the same time. So today, I don't use braille music at all. So when I'm playing as a group, I just know all the tunes and you just pick it up and away you go. <laughs> Life in general is really an exciting journey. Perhaps the most important aspect of, of ageing is really always continuing to learn. I think one needs to be able to look back and think about and saying, well, you know, all the things I wanted to do in life, I've been able to do. All the interests that I wanted to pursue, I was able to do that. For me, when I look back and I think, yeah, I've achieved and I've done up till now all the things that I've wanted to do. But hopefully, in the future, there's going to be new aspects and new interests that's going to open up. And so those I'll, I'll take on as a challenge, just as I have all the others in the past.